Um, and finally, in, in the different areas, uh, <laughs> I did, we, we need some photography without uh, getting my face off there, but the, um, the final area that uh, took uh, years of development is uh, we've also developed the first uh, back contacted thin foam cell, which allows us to very rapidly, uh, for, for one, it allows us to very rapidly assemble um, cells into strings and panels. Um, uh, just an example of uh, some of sample output, the, the front end roll process is a roll process, and then the nice thing about roll processing is the first couple of meters in, in, a, in a tool in a station, it dials itself into a certain steady state, and you know, then you keep the roll running for the next 1,800 meters, or for the next mile of substrate, you, you keep it running at the solid state. And um, that's how a process has been designed, so they, they get into solid state mode and get very uh, almost straight line output in terms of, in particular, most complicated um, electrical characteristics, that's a voltage, you know, to maintain high voltage. Um, so very, very good uh, uh, uniformity. One, one aspect that uh, I'd like to talk about in the conjunction also, why we think we can scale fairly quickly to from almost marginal volume to high volume is uh, one, one thing that kicks in here is uh, the, the Somewhat different approach we take to thin foam, meaning we don't do monolithic integration. As you know, it, as you deposit thin foams, so people who deposit thin foams directly in glass, you sort of have the, the pleasure and uh, not so pleasure of uh, monolithic integration. Uh, we, we don't do monolithic integration. We, we have cells and, and they're back contact cells and we just assemble them very quickly after a sorting step. And uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, as you do cell sorting and uh, stringing, you really minimize your mismatch losses between the cells, which, which really kick in if you, if you model things exponentially in any monolithic integration. Um, and really result into, you know, if you have the original cell distribution in some way, uh, if you do cell sorting, you just lose um, some of the area. Uh, where, where the cells don't relate, so you, you left shift your penal, your penal efficiency distribution a little bit to the left. If you do monolithic integration, you might have uh, many cells here in one panel, but a couple of cells here. You get these mismatch losses, and they result in a very, very uh, long tail distribution. And uh, the, so the, that's, that's based on, you can simply statistically model these type of things. The uh, flip side of this is if you start ramping a manufacturing operation um, and let's say 5% of your cells aren't, you definitely don't want to use these type of cells. In our case, we just throw them away. Um, and the, you know, roughly speaking, if you have a panel with 100 cells and your cell material cost is about your panel material cost, so each cell costs about one two hundredth of a panel. So if you throw away 5%, you know, you throw away 2.5% in terms of value. Um, if you uh, have to, in a monolithic case, you know, you throw away 100% of the value. And so the flip side of this is the, uh, as you ramp production, and as you have suboptimal yield in the beginning, it doesn't quite kill you in terms of the, the dollar value loss of this. You can actually ramp more quickly, and, and as you ramp, you can, uh, through the cell current matching, um, have uh, in the aggregate better efficiency too. Um, here's a video of the uh, <coughs> Nano Solar San Jose in California. I'm showing here our, our production coder, um, which is, you see the nanoparticle link coming in here. And uh, the startup of the, the printing process, it's a simple coding process. And uh, this thing is running at uh, 100 feet a minute, or even 200 or 300 feet a minute. Actually, the faster we code, it turns out, the more precise the coding is. But at this throughput, this single tool is a gigawatt of uh, capacity for this tool. And so I don't think uh, many, many of you have seen single tools that cost very little that produce um, a gigawatt in a single, single tool. I'll put your back contact cells coming out at the end of the line and, uh, and the overview. So obviously, if you have one tool that has a gigawatt, you still have other process steps. And um, we have, we, it's going to take us a while to uh, 
to get them to match this tool. But you know, the, the core semiconductor process is uh, we've uh, managed to um, get this to this level. Uh, in terms of cost per watt, um, you know, First Solar doing an excellent job, of course, in the industry, and we consider it the benchmark. Um, and uh, we come in distinctly. I mean, we, we wouldn't have uh, our entire plan was always, you know, you've got to be, like I said in a conference, if you're a new company, um, you've got to come in distinctly below First Solar, because otherwise, why bother? First Solar product is just fine otherwise, and they can uh, replicate things very strongly. And um, in that in particular in combination, because as you talk about uh, this type of level here in terms of price point, uh, this is where grid parity starts. And a grid parity, in our view, is $2 a watt, two do typically $2.50 a watt, half for balance of system, half for your panel. So um, the, the market opens up um, so the access to that opportunity is uh, fairly tight at these levels, and uh, so you certainly need to manufacture it distinctly below one dollar. Capital efficiency is one of the things that you've seen in the coding process, for instance, the uh, um, scaling, and, and uh, this is one key function to this. The, I'd like to uh, actually go into detail a little bit about the CIGS cost structures. Um, you know, we have extremely detailed models developed over a couple of years. And we've also simulated any number of any other processes, in particular, you know, using a high vacuum process on glass, using one on stainless steel, printing on glass, and um, our type of process. So in each case, obviously, you have uh, panel components such as the glass. You, have, you, you do have the carrier foil in the foil-based approaches, which, depending on what you use, can cost uh, differential amounts. In terms of bottom electrode, we benefit from using the foil as conductivity primarily. Uh, with other foils, you actually need to do barrier films, et cetera, that reduce in cost. Uh, printing, non-vacuum makes a difference. And um, the top electrode is key, what, uh, how that affects things. So in the aggregate, it's just uh, these things add up. And uh, if you compare like the first solar so 09 reference, um, we think you know, the dividing line is simply going to be between fundamentally between high vacuum. So we don't see how high vacuum CIGS can get below for solar's cost. And, um, and you know, I think a lot of people forget that uh, you know, for solar is actually a, it's a low vacuum. It's not a non-vacuum process. But it's a low vacuum process that is actually quite fast. You know? And so I think a lot of these uh, new CIGS companies just didn't get the baseline right on uh, the cost of vacuum. You know? um, here's one of our first uh, panel design. We haven't announced in that much detail yet, but we do quite a few things differently in the panel design too to drive cost further. Um, these ground mounted installations that we're very much streamlining with. Uh, some of the same partners that uh, for Solar is also working with in terms of standard system blocks and really rolling out um, these uh, particularly grant mounted systems at, uh, you know, ultimately a megawatt a day or so. And uh, this is one of our key, key application areas, just because uh, um, it's a segment where the penal dollars per watt kicks in a very undiluted way in the system level. And happy to take. Uh, any other questions? <laughs>